Welcome to the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Caleb Teske, and today I'm joined by Matt and Lane LaPlante uh, from Smoke Ranch Redemption in Guilford, Vermont, guys. Thanks for being here today. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yeah, apparently, Matt, you, you called me and said, uh, uh, you called me last year and we were supposed to circle back to this. So um, thanks thanks for reaching back out again, because sometimes uh, I, I do get a little lost in, in the queue. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, we just, um, we were really busy too. I mean, we were like everyone scrambling to get plants in, um, trying to put everything together before it was too late in the summer. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get to that before we do. Um, would you guys mind doing a five minute life story each? Sure. Yeah. Well, she's originally from uh, a small town North of Boston. No, don't tell her life story. I want her to tell it. <laughs> Well, it it ties in. I I was in okay. Oregon for thirty years, and she she packed up everything, a suitcase and a bunny rabbit, and took off to Oregon. She heard Portland was the cool place to live. I had heard it was similar to Burlington, Vermont, and so I got a one way ticket, sight unseen. And I was there for a decade. Yeah, and we met uh, in two thousand fourteen, and I was um, it was an internet date. And I think I found her on what was it, OK Cupid, uh -huh. and uh, yeah. I kind of skirted around what I was doing for a living. I didn't want to say, "Hey, I was a cannabis grower." Uh, and then by the end of the day, I was, it was pretty clear that that was like something that was okay by her. And um, and yeah, it, it just it just it worked out. We, she, I think she told me on the second date she was like, "I'm moving back to the East Coast, and that's non-negotiable." And I was like, well, you know, let's see how that goes. Nine years later, yeah. here we are. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, to I guess to, to flesh that out, I was in, in uh, the medical uh, side of the industry for a while. I was also, I was also black market, um, but I was in queue, and this is what pertains to the name. I was in queue for a rec license in Oregon for, I think, two years. And by the time they got to my name and said, hey, we want to come to your site and inspect your building and do all that, the price for outdoor cannabis there was around $300. And I was just, yeah, I just, I canceled it. There was no sense in growing something that was not profitable. And, so what, uh, did you did you build out a facility out in Oregon and then just had to sit there waiting with your thumb in your ass or something? Yeah, pretty much. Well, I, I had saved up enough money to, to get a piece of property and the the search for property was difficult oregon was open to non-residents so a bunch of people from all over the country flooded in to to try and get that license and houses were on the they were on the market for 10 minutes and then they were off and i found a place up in the hills above portland through a friend who was shooing this property owner's horses and he let me put an offer in before it went on market um, so I was there for four or five years and it was on Smoke Ranch Road. So it, it was, you know, we, we tried to do the legal thing out there and it was extremely difficult um, and more expensive. And that that Smoke Ranch project failed. So this is this is our redemption, so to speak. I, I was wondering if it was a video game reference yeah. or a, a second <laughs> no, chance kind of thing. Yeah. When we made that name and that logo and everything, she didn't even know what that video game was. It was, <laughs> it was just, yeah, she's, it was by chance. It kind of had that, that look and feel. To yeah. It. The label is totally um, it, reminiscent of the video game vibe. Yeah, for we, sure. We've heard that like after the fact now, but we're sticking with it. Yeah. So hopefully there's no trademark infringement, yeah. but yeah, that's basically <laughs> her, her on the logo. And um, this is like, our, our chance to, to do a legal business in a, in a market. Well, the state, we, I kind of had a feeling that the state was going to be friendly to smaller cultivators. We didn't want to try and get like a 10,000 square foot license. We just wanted, I, I wanted property. Um, I wanted to grow my own food. I wanted animals eventually, but that's still something that we're squabbling over. Uh, so yeah. So anyway, like this, the small license really, really fit our lifestyle. What did you guys get for a license? Just a, a mixed tier one. 
Yeah, so we did 125 plants outdoors, and then uh, we have a building that's about 560 square feet. I'm probably going to expand that to fill out the 1,000 square feet, and no real plans to do more. I don't think I can do more than that, really, uh, with all the other stuff I'm doing um, you know, at the moment. I, I did do cultivation, or I'm sorry, I did do consulting for... I don't know, over, over 12 years or so. And that was mostly agronomy work. I would, I would work with, I did do that outside of cannabis too, um, but pivoted towards cannabis because it was more profitable. Um, so people would pull soil samples, they'd get a, a readout from a lab and I'd tell them exactly how many pounds per acre of whatever to put in their soil. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get, we're going to get to that. Save that yeah, for we'll later. That. We're going to nerd out. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Lane, can we get a five minute life story from you? That's my story. Um, I mean, cannabis uh, in enthusiast, uh, definitely enjoyed it for years and years and years. Um, way more so in the past. The uh, recently, I've I've been taking a break so I can hang out with this guy. Um, but. I enjoy smoking. I enjoy helping Matt out when I can, trimming, drying, you know. She's been she's been jarring. Jarring, packaging, labeling. labeling. Uh, yeah, I'm an East Coaster. Checked out the West Coast scene for a decade. Love it over there. Such good quality of life, fresh air, great food, plenty of hiking, places to backpack. Uh, it's awesome out there, but I'm an East Coaster, so it's really good to be back over here. Uh, found a husband, dragged him back. Not kicking and screaming. He likes it out here. Um, yeah, Smoke Ranch has been really fun to be part of. Uh, we're, you know, 50-50 owners, so it's been kind of fun, like, going in on that with my with my family, with my husband. Um, it's been a lot of work, but it's it's been really cool to be part of this scene, uh, specifically in Vermont, because this is where some really good, great people are. Well, you can tell them about your education. Oh, um, so I have a day job. This is not, I wish this could be what I do all, all day, every day. Um, my day job is in program management for an animal welfare nonprofit. Um, so I do have experience managing projects and programs, uh, including with Salesforce. So everything that Vermont CCB um, is using for their management is, is what I dabble in as well. Um, so I did have the pleasure of managing our uh, application process for the license. Um, I mean, applications for, um, you know, insurance and banking is just more, you know, more of the same that CCB um, kind of has you do as well. Um, but yeah, I, I work with animals. Uh, by my day. girlfriend, yo, know, my girlfriend worked for a, a rescue for a long time. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. So I'm like Santa Claus for rescues across the country where I give them grants, give them dollars so they can keep on doing their the good work they do. Oh, um, sick. Yeah, there's some great ones here in Vermont, too. Um, that's what I do by day. And then by night, I'm packaging and putting compliance stickers on jars and, you know, helping make sales. <laughs> and so you handled the, the application portion of this. I did. Yep. How, how do you feel that went for you guys? Um, it. I mean, you, you certainly I know that, um, you know, there there were other firms out there willing to do you know, the legwork for you if you just supply information and they kind of submit it for you. I know Vermont Cannabis Solutions was probably the the primary one that helped a lot of applicants in this state, um, which we considered. But once we kind of dug into it and dug into the requirements, it took some time, but it was uh, and very detailed. But if you're organized, um, you know, it was doable. Um, I will and say. And if you're used to write, if you're used to writing grants and, and stuff like that, I, I yeah. bet that's. Um, not out of the ordinary for you sure yeah so i'm on kind of the ccb's end where i write the programs that people apply to um so kind of looking at the way looking at the way they worded some of their requirements i found a little bit confusing and in fact we did have an incomplete application um where they required you know some additional documents that i didn't quite see a place to upload in the first place otherwise we would have um so there were a few kind of clunky clunky parts along the way where it could have been a little bit clearer. Um, but you know, you just, you just keep at it and you stay on top of it and you try your best to be as organized as possible on your end so that yeah. it makes, you know, things a little bit smoother on sure. their end. Sure. Building out websites has never been Vermont's specialty. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, it's their first year managing this. They're very busy. They have a lot going on. So yeah. And they were underfunded and, and understaffed, quite frankly. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm keeping it. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. To, to compare it to other states, they, they, they did I do, I don't know how to turn that off either. We, they did do a lot of things right there. Other states required a ton of money in escrow accounts before you even applied for a license. How much money? Uh, I I just heard from a buddy in Mass that, and I don't know what for for what license size this was. It might be for like a ten thousand square foot, but he said something like five hundred thousand in escrow, which seems like I mean I I didn't look online to verify that, but he was he's deep into the licensing process, and I. I believe him, um, but there's other states that just want much more complicated licensing. And for tier tier one and tier one mixed, Vermont made it really easy for people to just set something up at their house and start growing. And that was one of the things that they, you know, they did well. I think it, regulating that is is another issue. Uh, we'll have. They, they need to tighten up on their, obviously like their testing and their, their pesticide, their pesticide testing. So I, yeah. we, we can dig into that later can, too. Can we, um, can we, what I'd like to do first is if you maybe paint a picture of sort of the Oregon situation. I know you, you mentioned it a couple of times. Also, I want to shout out to your, your fucking baby there. That is a quiet yeah. baby. He's quite well. He's Word on baby. Right yeah. Yeah. Is I'm you hoping you can tell us. I'm hoping you tell us a little bit what it's like out west. Yeah. I well, mean, well, what it was like when you were there and, and you know, whatever you know now also. Sure. Yeah. So the, the licensing, the license that I was going for would have allowed for an acre outside and that's no, no plant count. And inside, um, I can't remember the square footage, but they, they wanted more cameras. They wanted, they wanted specific types of doors. They wanted the the licensing was very specific they they went into a lot more detail and i i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing it just would have taken a lot longer to actually complete the license there um but yeah another thing that's different in oregon is that they have labs traveling to cultivators and actually they they open up the harvest lot bins and they pull a representative sample out so of So they're bin. actually the state is doing um the sample collection out there yep yeah, so they that's one thing that they could do and it would it would make it more difficult for people to falsify tests here if they assuming if they, that the state is trustworthy. Yeah, I mean there there's that issue too. Um I do know growers out there that know the lab techs, you know, like there's always I mean it's it's kind of like the mob, like there's always someone who knows someone and if you pay him enough you could slip in stuff from elsewhere. I I don't know. It's just it's just an extra step that makes it more difficult for rule breaking behavior. And you said that you basically tried to start a business out there. And, and by the time they got to your property, the price crunch had happened. Yeah. And, and, and over issued licenses too. Well, I think that coupled with the fact that you don't have to be an Oregon resident. So you've got big money coming in from all, from everywhere, yeah. um, gobbling up the licenses with funding to really scale up uh, right off the bat. And so the, owner, the owners don't even need to live in the state. They could just, you know, send someone there, there to live at the property and pay them. It was a fast race to the bottom. Yeah. Which is a bummer because that always seems to just screw the growers who do the most work, it seems like, in the yeah. industry. Yeah, they're, they're the ones that hurt the most three or four years in, into the process. And I mean, Vermont, the prices will drop in Vermont too, we will will not see prices that we are seeing now in three or four years. I don't think it's going to happen as fast as it did in Oregon. Um, but yeah, the the retail end of it does um, hold hold stronger for longer. They I, in Oregon, there's still shops charging twelve dollars a gram for like higher higher end indoor years into years into rec, and they're and they're paying the grower. Uh, say like fifteen hundred dollars a pound rather than close to three, so they're like tripling, quadrupling their money. And, and what'd you say it was down to like three hundred bucks out there in Oregon? 
For outdoor, yeah. So I, at the same time that the outdoor price was 300, the indoor price could still be around 12 to 15. There, there was a lot of outdoor being produced. And, and from what I've gathered, just from talking to people in Vermont, if, if indoor prices were to come down to 12 to 15, boy, it sounds like some of them would be in pretty big trouble as well. Yeah, it, it becomes very difficult to um, operate a profitable business when prices are at that point. It costs typically indoor growers more than a thousand a pound to produce. So if you if you're at twelve hundred, what are you going to do? Pay your trimmers and then break even? Um, it's just difficult. But there's ways to mitigate that. I mean, from the the work that I was doing as a consultant would sometimes be just a fertility recipe. So when people are buying, like if if they're using bottled nutrients, they're often paying for a markup. It costs money to ship nutrients dissolved in water. And often growers would pay anywhere from 40 cents a gallon for their nutrient solution up to a dollar. In the, in the like years, years ago, it was, if you're using say Canna brand nutrients, you're paying over a dollar per gallon. And if you buy the raw salts and you mix them yourselves, you pay like two cents a gallon. Wow. So you're saving like uh, 50 times your money there. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so a facility that's, that has a quarter million dollar a year nutrient or fertility bill, I could get them down to like, I don't know, $10,000 sometimes. Wow. Yeah. We're going to, he's going to check out and go eat. I think. I'm going to let you guys have fun with your soil conversation. Yeah. It's a right. pleasure speaking with you. Yeah. Yeah. Really good meeting you, Caleb. Uh, yeah. Take care. You're doing. Definitely love following you and we'll talk some other time. Yeah, good luck with everything. Thank Thanks. you. Um, yeah, so I think we were we were talking about is um, margins. Like it, it, later on, when when it becomes difficult to produce, uh, and like for for anywhere over like five hundred dollars a pound, um, anything that you can cut uh, makes a difference. So like I I think I can at this point I think I can produce. A pound for four hundred dollars, uh, and that's including like a pretty a pretty good trim bill too. So trimmers will make like if I pay them hourly, I'll, I think I'm paying like twenty five dollars an hour, um, and I don't know what that works out to per, per pound. Sometimes I, I remember in, in Oregon I was paying trimmers a long time ago like two hundred dollars a pound, and then when it when weed was really cheap, it was I think down to one twenty five a pound. So. Yeah. So anyway, there, there's there's ways to eke out a living still when the prices drop. How many employees do you have working for you, Matt? Uh, we're we're basically trimming all this ourselves. Oh, so just the two of you. Yeah, I'm not producing. I'm not producing a lot right now. Hmm. And I'm not like a huge. I don't. I don't really enjoy trimming that much. But I'm. I'm pretty. I think I'm a better trimmer than I am a grower. I'm. I'm like more efficient. It's. I did. I've just. Tr I've trimmed so much so much wood in my life that i'm just like blasting through it damn dude i don't think i've ever heard anyone say that yeah yeah right well there, i know there's a lot of other guys right now that are doing tier ones that are that are also trimming their their own stuff too it, it's just i don't know until you get about um like over a thousand square feet of indoor you, you need to you need to start hiring at that point and, and now boy you're in Guilford, man. I feel like you're right down there by mass. Mm -hmm. So if you're growing and you got to drive your samples to the lab, how far of a, a drive is that for you? Two hours and 40 minutes. And um, each yeah, way we're not, we're not stoked about that. We're not, you know, that's, that's each way, right? Matt? Yes. Yeah. That's it's, it's an all day trip to get up to Colchester or, um, Burlington or maybe it's two two hours and 30 minutes to Burlington but uh, yeah we we are in a lot of shops up there now but we we really try and do like a um, we try and get like three or four shops in one trip if possible it's just like another boy another uh expense you know and, and a day of you know not doing other work just to get your samples up to the lab totally it's a day that i'm not in my garden 
Um, yeah. So, so in, and Lane, you know, we have a, we have a three month old. I'm, it's tough for her to meet, for me to leave this kid for seven, eight hours. Uh, so we, we've had a lot of really long, tough days, like running on four hours of sleep total, maybe. Um, but it, I mean, I, I like it. I like working for myself. Me yeah, too. She, like, she likes working with me too, I guess. So we're, yeah. How, do, how does that work out? I, I like asking all the couples, you guys, you guys get along well on the job. We do. Yeah. Well, she's what she didn't say is she's got a master's in, is it business administration? Yeah. So she's, she's got an MBA. Um, I, I have, yeah, a I can't believe you left that out lane. <laughs> yeah. I, and her thesis was entering into new leveraging corporate responsibility as a market entry strategy into the cannabis industry. So she did me a big favor, you know, <laughs> like I was like, yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great thesis. You, you go with that and then it'll make it easier when we, when we get here. So, so you've combined, you've got an MBA, she's got the MBA and, and you have a, a botany degree. I have a botany degree and it's not, I, I don't do botany. Uh, I mean, well, like it's, it's, it's very rare in this day and age for uh, companies to send people out in the middle of the jungle to look for like novel compounds and plants or something like that. Is that what uh, you were doing? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. So like, um, I think like, like some of the more famous botanists uh, were the guys that were going into the jungle looking for rubber plants around world war II, um to uh, break, you know, the Japanese monopoly uh, or, or like, for example, if you're looking for antibiotics or pharmaceuticals, it, we don't we don't invent antibiotics. We find them in in fungal species, or you know, we find them in nature. So that was kind of like the big draw for getting either a microbiology or a botany position is you could you could find a job that's like that where that you get paid to to go to an exotic place and look for something new. Um, it's just not exactly. super common anymore. That's awesome. Yeah, but I like so I in instead of getting into like traditional botany or staying in academia, I um, got an ag certification and started doing soil work. Can, can you tell us what that is, the agronomy certification? Yeah, it's just, um, it basically states that I'm capable of doing the math to accurately calculate the amount of minerals that should go into your soil. And it, the, these are things that people, if you spend enough time online, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you don't have to get a degree. Uh, everything's, everything's online these days. And I, mm. I, I would say that I've learned more on forums or just digging around literature than I, than I have actually in, in school. I know. I wish the internet hit just a little bit sooner because boy, I still <laughs> fucking owe a lot of money and I could have done all of that online. Yeah, and that, really yeah that's the other con too. Like, you know, people, I still have buddies that are, that are in debt and, and, and they didn't really translate into a high paying job. Um, no, it, no, it did not. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like the, the internet's such a powerful tool and there's, there's a ton of information and it's just up for grabs. And uh, if you want to learn about soil science, there's, you can pick up, there's a couple of good like starter textbooks. Um, let's see, I think like the ideal soil kind of explains soil calculations. That was a book by uh, Michael Estera. Um, the Intelligent Gardener by Steve Solomon is another good book for, for soils, like soil science starters. Um, and then there was a lot of, uh, work in the mid uh, 19, 1900s done by, um, let's say, William Albrecht and Tidgens and these like, they, they were university scientists that were doing work with like uh, mineral balancing and figuring out how to like best um, amend field soil. So you, you can dig up their their papers online and just read about, you know, what what they recommend for targets and uh, you don't have to pay someone like me. 
Well, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm getting away from, I don't have time. I don't have time to do this. Yeah. Way to ruin your own consulting business. I know, right. I'm like, yeah, agenda suicide. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing more on cultivation. I don't have time to do anything other than cultivation right now. Hmm. It, it does seem like a very, um, like all consume. I've got a friend who's still trimming his outdoor from last fall and is already doing his starts. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, yeah. It never it's ends. Like, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, I guess we could, we could, on that note, we could jump into the reports and that what I, what I want to do is kind of give people an idea of where they can start with this because um, amending, like blindly amending a field, um, it works. Like you, you can, you can get close to what the plants need uh, without pulling a soil test. But some fields are really, they're really out of, out of balance. They're really low pH or they're, or they're really high pH, not likely in Vermont, but. Um, you want me so to pull up these, um, th is this the stuff you sent me earlier? Yeah. And this, this is my own property. This is. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. Do it. Wham. So th this is UVM's test and. The, the next slide we'll show, don't, don't show it yet, but we're going to get to another, another lab's analysis of this, this exact same soil. Um, the, the tests are different. Uh, UVM ran the soil through, um, it's called a, a, a Morgan extract or a, a extraction. And it's a really, it's a, a weaker acid extraction than the spectrum test. This was run at 4.5 pH and it doesn't pull all the minerals out of the soil sample that a typical, like they call it a Melic 3 is the other, um, the other test. And that's a 3.0 pH, very, very acidic pH. It dissolves everything. Um, and on this, on this test, you'll see that the recommendations in the bottom are for hemp and it, it gives you a recommendation of two pounds per thousand square feet of nitrogen, which is fine. Like it, you could even do more than that for hemp or, or cannabis. It doesn't recommend any phosphorus, which I think is a mistake. Um, there's a, cannabis is a phosphorus hog. It, you can, you can apply a lot and it will, it will use all of it. So, um, so here's the, even though this test says um, value found is 7.4, optimal range is between four to seven for most crops. So even, um, yeah. even though it's finding a value higher than is optimal for most crops, you still think um, because cannabis is a phosphate hog that you could use more than that. Yes. Yeah. And also uh, potassium, it pulls a lot of potassium out of the soil annually, especially if you're growing really big plants. Like remember what the hemp guys were doing years ago? You you drive by a field and there was like five six foot plants just all the way across the field. That that like that biomass is going to contain a lot of potassium, and it's not necessarily going back into the field. Some some people might be doing that. They would till it in at the end of the season, or they let it decompose on the top of the soil. Sometimes they won't, and if you don't, those minerals are gone for good. They're they're taken to a compost pile or off off the field and you'd be doing yourself a favor a favor if you reapplied that mineral content back to the field the next year can i ask you something um when uh do you take this sample yourself and send it to uvm or do they come out and have someone collect a sample i you do it yourself and so if if you like farmers that have large acreage like like in the Midwest, people that have, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of acres, they'll, they'll pay someone to do the, the testing. And, you know, I would go out and I would run, run an X pattern through a field uh, and pull samples and then submit it for them and get yeah. paid to do that work for the farmer. Um, but most, most people in Vermont are, are just going to do it themselves. And what you do is you the, the goal is to take a representative sample of what your field is like, not just 10 square feet. You want to walk a, a pattern through that field. Right. And I've seen that sort of hourglass um, sort of shape that seems like a, a fair way to go about it, something like that. Yeah. And, and if it's a flat field, that that's probably sufficient. If there's a big dip in the field, like say a, a 50 foot rise 
at the bottom of that that hill the soil will be a little different so you want to do another sample down there and these basic soil tests are 10 15 dollar range i think spectrum it was 12 12 dollars at uvm it was i think it was 15 i, I can't remember but they're, they're the soil test is is 10 20 bucks at uvm yep Plus, if you plus if you collect a sample, do they send you a specimen to like like collect it in like a cup? You no, got okay. Just use a, a sandwich bag. So after, but that's that seems pretty fucking cheap, dude. It is cheap. It's it's invaluable information for for what you paid. You know exactly what's in your soil. Um. So just throwing it in a sandwich bag and sending it off, and the turnaround time is different for labs. I think UVM, um, took over a week and a half which is strange because they're close to us but i think i didn't confirm this not bad yet. for 15 20 bucks though yeah for sure i i think they are sending they're they're outsourcing the work somewhere and i heard it was yeah. main i didn't confirm it but i know if you do send send to spectrum or logan in ohio they they do that themselves so so yeah like it's it's cheap you find a an elemental readout for your soil and then you can base you're amending that you're on that readout. Now, the difference between the two tests was pretty significant. The, there we go. You want me to pull this one up? Bang. Yeah. So this is this is Spectrum Analytic in Ohio, and they um, same soil, same soil. Yeah. And on their on their recommendations, UVM. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 UVM was saying that you need. You have too much potassium and too much magnesium. And then this this test, which I feel is more accurate, it's more representative of what I was trying to do this year. They they said it was low in both those elements. And magnesium's not not like really that much of a yield um, limiting element. It's the plant uses magnesium to make chlorophyll and and primarily and then Potassium is the one that's that's more important. That's that's a yield and quality element. And if you don't have enough of it, your your flowers aren't going to get get that big, and your plant's not going to be as cold hardy later in the yeah, season. Yeah, and this says it's way low. It says way low. So I so what I do is I I went with Spectrum in in this situation, and I I added a bunch of potassium this year. And it, the re, the readout for all the micronutrients was was after I had applied those. So you'll see copper is like close to ten parts per million. That's not natural. Like that is the addition of copper sulfate. And copper is one of those things that scares a lot of people. Yeah, it's a heavy metal, but it's it's also a plant nutrient. If you don't have copper in the soil, the plants are missing an element that they're needing for proper immune function. So this is all, yeah, this is all stuff that's like, it's, it's good to know before you apply because uh, you can know exactly how much to apply. And so this was a lab in Ohio, you said? Yep. Yeah. Spectrum is in, um, I think the, the town is called Washington Courthouse. And how much did this cost you? This one was $12. But, so this is actually maybe a little cheaper than the UVM one, and you think yeah. maybe a little more reliable. I I have more confidence in Spectrum and even even Logan than uh, than the labs on the East Coast here. Hmm. Is there anything else you want to point out on here? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this off for a second. If if you're done with these graphs, yeah, okay. yeah you can you can we can move on. Wham wham. Okay, cool. Uh, you, you know, one thing you also talked about, I think, when we were on the phone was uh, pesticides. And yeah. I know that we've seen a couple of people here recently in Vermont uh, that have been nicked for uh, fine for using uh, pesticides. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that issue. Yeah, or I think just in general, that, you know, I mentioned that Oregon had labs uh, sending employees out to do the testing. They were, they were also doing that for THC and cannabinoids. Um, but I think that that is something that Vermont needs to get on top of primarily for safety reasons in, in, in uh, products that people are smoking uh, or, or ingesting. Um, so like if they, had, if they had people coming out and sampling flowers, um, by, I think by, by Oregon law, 
they were supposed to seal up the product bin with a tamper proof bag after they tested it. And I'm, I, I think at this point, like that's still the law, but they're not really enforcing it. So like the, the guy doesn't really seal the bag, but that, that is something that could happen. It would be a benefit as far as like product safety, but it would also, it would also be a detriment as far as like product quality. So for example, like if you produced a, a lot of flour, like a, a 10 pound lot of flour and the guy came out and tested it and he sealed it up again, it would be sealed in, in a bag that's maybe not the right material to store flour long-term. Um, growers couldn't store it in jars. Uh, glass jars are great long-term storage vessels for, for cannabis. Um, there's downsides, but the, the upside would be better product safety. How do you feel about this idea of the state starting a, like a, a third party testing lab? Uh, well, I mean, they're, they're struggling with some things that they shouldn't be struggling with right now. Uh, product, product, product registration seems like a big one. Product registration is a big one. And if they're two months behind, I mean, we had some stuff that was, it took two months. And at that point, like, yeah, we, we prefer to sell fresher flour than that. I, I believe now, Tito mentioned this at the meeting. I don't know if you follow the meetings closely, but at the yeah. last meeting, he made a comment to that effect, you know, where the sweet spot is sort of like, I, I think he said somewhere in the five to six week range, and if you miss it, you've kind of now your your product is just you're you're giving people maybe not your best product when it has to sit there for so long, um, waiting okay. for the the red tape. And the, and that that sort of thing influences um, growers' decisions on the volume that they want to drop off at shops. So, for example, a lot of my friends in Oregon would never sell more than a pound to a shop. What they didn't want is if they sold two pounds, they didn't want the shop to get to that second pound eight weeks later and ha and have it not be great quality. That influence. So, yeah. So that's just a bit of quality control right there. Yeah. And Tito, I mean, I, I haven't met Tito, but when I was in burn gallery dropping flour, they, they have a environmentally controlled room. And th this is something that, that some of the shops are doing and I, I'm really grateful for it. They're, they're controlling temperature and humidity and that prolongs that that window of time that flour is good if you have flour sitting at 75 degrees exposed it's going to go bad a lot faster than that so there there are some shops that are in, investing in like you know better control to prolong their flour quality and it's it's appreciated hmm. what is the ideal uh con conditions to store it at for long term I, I can't say this with 100% confidence, but I keep my room very cold. I keep it around 50 degrees and like 55% humidity in that range. I mean, I, I think you could go colder and a little bit drier if they're sealed up. Um, but in, in general, if you can get it below 50, or I'm sorry, below 60 degrees or 65 degrees and keep hum humidity under control, you're doing you're doing pretty well. Uh, what you don't want is to have your flower sitting exposed for long periods of time in 70 degree rooms, improper humidity control. It gets too humid or, or too dry. Either way is bad. And, and I, you know, I never realized this until really the last year, but like apparently that direct sunlight, at least when you're drying and curing, I, I my, my dude had his whole drying shed wrapped in like this black plastic uh -huh. and I, I thought it was like he was gonna have he was gonna cut it off and like ah we're gonna reveal the new building he's like no no that's the drying room that keeps it dark um i i didn't realize that was such a, a crucial factor as well yeah that's that's very uh that's extreme if if he's trying to keep every single photon out or whatever um but yeah it's 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 one of those things where like if you've ever smoked cannabis in Central America or South America, you'll often get sold an owl pellet, you know, or something that looks pretty, pretty rough. They, they dry it in, in the sun. They just, they cut the plant down and lay it down in the forest and let it dry that way. And then they, they bag it up. 
So yeah, there it's just it's so what is it? The UV rays will break down the, the terpenes or something? Oh yeah, you I mean UV degrades a lot of material. It'll it'll degrade plastic. If you have if you have plastic sitting out in the yard, you'll see it turn that that opaque color and it'll get brittle and fall apart. Hmm. Um it's just it's very destructive. So it it'll it's funny though, like cannabis has a I think if I remember right, uh, THC is one of the most uh, effective biomolecules at absorbing a wide a range or a wide range of radiation. And I think it's like as if it's almost it's second to melanin in your skin. So from from like an evolutionary standpoint, the the plant is not only producing resin as like an anti herbivory compound, like a sticky substance to deter chewing animals, but it's also it's also producing it to protect its seeds from radiation. So like wow. normally UV has the potential to get through the the plant tissue on the bract and hit that seed and mutate or cause damage to the DNA in the seed. So it, it coats that bract in resin and that's an extra layer of defense. Hmm. And that's just one of the many things um, that it does. Hell yeah. I learned something today. Okay. <laughs> Good. That's awesome. I never heard that. Hmm. Um, so, oh, but we, we got derailed a little bit. So we were going to talk about pesticides. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, obviously Eagle 20 is a really, that's a really bad one. Like that, that's something that people should have known 10 years ago was unacceptable. And I think if I remember right, that one combusts into, or one of the, one of the combustion products is cyanide. Um, so, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not good. That's not, that's uh, not a good one. <laughs> uh, and then the other ones like the, you know, there's all, all these other chemicals that they put on the, on the ban list. I think another one got brought up recently is py pyrethroids and they're, they're endo endocrine disruptors. So, I mean, a lot what I saw outdoors this season was more insect pressure than I had seen in other parts of the country, but nothing really um, drastic enough to warrant even spraying insecticidal soap or oil, horticultural oils or any, anything like that. If I don't have to spray, I really don't want anything on the flower, even if it alters the, even if the, the worst thing that it does is it alters the taste of the flower. Well, and now some of these insects probably aren't harmful, I would no, imagine. I, yeah, I think the the most damage I, I saw was from an insect called a tarnished plant bug. And it it, it would burrow into the, the stem and cause a, a diversion in the growth. And it I didn't lose any plants. Um I I can't say that I even really lost any flower because of those those bugs. I was gonna say sometimes when you divert it, it seems like you just even get bigger nuggets on the side. Yeah. <laughs> They're, to they're topping the plants. No, I, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there's all these options. You, you, you have the ability to alter the plants. Um, how do I explain this? I insect an antennae, they work by detecting radiation. So everything in nature is giving off a, a radioactive, like a, a radiation signature, an electromagnetic magnetic signature. And if you overfeed plants with say nitrogen and they're, they're really green and they're lush, but they're, they're weaker plants because they're overfed, their, their signature is broadcast to an insect as a weak plant. And you, you can have a moth flying over a field. It will go to that weak plant versus the healthy plant. So controlling nitrogen in the field and supplying enough calcium and enough copper and zinc. Those are the things that like get you on the right uh, foundation when it comes to like defending your crop later in the season from fungal pathogens or insects. That's wild. So the insects, the insects are reading this, uh, this electromagnetic field being, being yeah. put off by the plane. And this is like, this is work. I think you can, uh, the book is called Tuning into Nature and it was written by Phil, Phil Callahan. And there, uh, I think it was him or, or Bruce Taniel, I can't remember, another, another ag agronomist was saying that like 
fungus is nature's they're, they're nature's garbage collectors they look for weak plants to get rid of it's kind of like kind of like a wolf pack looking for that injured animal on the outskirts of the herd you know like they're they're looking for the easy meal and the easy meal is a plant that is too it's built too weakly so you you build strong plants with calcium and you fill them out with potassium and you don't over fertilize with nitrogen and that's like that's basically outdoor growing in a nutshell yeah and you mentioned something about this before about networking with some folks that were selling inputs um fort v maybe fort v light telling them to add some gypsum i believe you said calcium is the most important input um i, I don't remember exactly what that was about but if you'd fill us in that would be great yeah i so I, I had a conversation pretty early on coming to Vermont with the Vermont compost guys, and I was looking for them to make me a soil mix. And they, they didn't want to because they didn't want to interrupt their their um, production schedule. They have a mix that they make, Fort V, Fort V Light, and those two products, they're, they're making a lot of that product annually. And my small 20-yard custom order by their standards was going to interrupt that production. So they, they didn't want to do it. But what I did want to plug this uh, during this podcast is a company out of Bridport called Rock Dust Local. And this guy, he knows he, he's got a, a quarry that's producing really exceptional material. <clears throat> as far as like um, the, the product that I bought from him this year is called St. George Black. And it's uh, half of it is a, it's it's a, what they call a. 50% lime calcium carbonate equivalent. So it functions as half strength uh, limestone, but it's also got a bunch of minerals in it. And if you're a cultivator that uses rock dust, I don't see why you wouldn't want to use that stuff. He's, he's, he is local. Like a lot of the quarries for minerals, uh, agricultural minerals are still on the West coast. So he's, he's a local uh, resource. That's extremely valuable. What'd you say? Bridport? Bridport, yeah, and, and the company's rocked us local. I would give him a call. Just make sure you have like an hour. He's a talker. He he will like he will he will keep you on the phone. He really likes talking about his products. Hey, good. The more the more you guys talk, the less I have to think about questions and stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So so I if we're um I think I think I diverted myself again from the pesticide talk. So it, there, are, there are alternatives. There's, there's the nutrition, the plant nutrition strategy to make your plants as beefy as possible and discourage insects from eating them. It doesn't, it doesn't work a hundred percent though. There's no way. I've never grown a plant that's so healthy that nothing attacks it out, outside. There's always insects are. They can eat just about anything. Yeah, and they're always there. Like they're you're not gonna, you, you can't yeah. kill them all. So I'm not. I won't make the claim that you can that you can fix insect pressure through plant nutrition, but it's a big component of 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 dealing with that. And then the next is you have predatory insects. Like we, I just uh, um, if you use compost, the the growers out there that use compost, they're very familiar with fungus gnats. You will get fungus gnats if you order a lot of the composts on the market. And there's two insects, I, I think it ordered from, the company's called Arbico Organics, they supply predatory insects. There's other suppliers too. I, I can't really tell you which one is the best. I just know the easiest one I found online. But fungus gnats can be controlled with nematodes and uh, rove beetles or a predatory mite um, called hypoaspis so rather than killing everything you're adding yeah. in something else that's alive to yep. kill it for you yeah you just introduce something that'll that'll control it and th those predators they don't kill every single one of your target insect but they reduce them to the point where they are not e economically damaging to your harvest right well they don't want to kill them all because then they got nothing left to eat yeah you want them to hang around because if if they hang around and they have they have a population if anything else flies into your field, they're going to be on top of it. There you go. Yeah. And if you have to spray something, there's a bunch of options too. There's horticultural soaps. There's, I mean, Dr. Bronner's, you can, you can spray Dr. Bronner's. No shit. Yeah. And the, that's and the, the goal, one soap I still use at home. Yeah. And the, the goal there is insects have, um, they have a, a waxy 
substance around their shell called a cuticle. And you can, with some soaps, you can, you can dissolve that cuticle and then they're exposed and they'll die afterwards from dehydration or they'll suffocate from the soap itself. And, and I've seen a lot of like, like peppermint things. It seems like bugs have sort of a natural aversion to yeah. peppermint or, or like cedar oil. I see they use a lot um, yeah. things like that. Clove oil, cinnamon. There's, there's all sorts of things that you can use. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of products on the market that are combination products. They do have a markup. You don't have to buy these expensive cannabis targeted products. That was another thing that I would get hired to do is to, to like get around the cannabis tax for products. Like it, you're buying nutrients, you're spending it, you're spending like, you know, orders of magnitude more than you would for the raw salt. And the same, the same applies for some of these um, like IPM products. And I've seen a lot of these guys um, talking about these Korean natural farming sort of techniques, making probiotics at home out of leftover rice water uh, yeah. and, and milk and, and things like that, which is, is something that I don't really know much about, but really fascinated me. Sounds like they were producing amendments um, for for pennies on the dollar compared to um, people that were purchasing them on the Internet. Yeah, it, we we could get into Korean natural farming, too. That's that's like a. That's Send it. A, a rabbit hole in itself but i think the people that are going to benefit the most from i won't discourage people from using korean natural farming practices but the people that are going to benefit the most from it are those that have low levels of certain elements in their soil so for example like we'll we'll in theory in like a theoretical situation say your soil only has one half of a ppm of copper in it and you apply a Korean natural farming like e extraction, there's enzymes, there's uh, organic acids, and there's active microbes in that solution that'll make things available in the soil that aren't as available to the plant without them. So you, you can either go, you can go that route or you can apply say five parts per million of copper sulfate uh, to your field. I, I go the elemental route because I, I, I feel strong and this is back this is backed by research too that if you if you put the stuff that that's necessary for biological life for life in the soil, they'll utilize it. There's already a native uh, microbiome in your soil. And if you give them more copper, they'll do the work. So I, and there, there's also research that shows that these brews that people make, like if you're making a compost tea. Yeah. Microbes, or some of these fermented uh, like fruit juices uh, I've seen a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. From the, from just, just the point of view of the microbes in those products that, that people are making at home, it's very common for those microbes to get out competed in the natural soil. So there, there's a bunch of stuff in your field that's been there for thousands of years and you might introduce a new bacillus species that's that's brewing in your in your brewer it's going to get smashed by the na the native microbes it, most of the time well the even if he's like this one guy was telling me he's like i got apple trees over here so i can go pick the apples and this is all like he's using plants from his garden and fruit that's growing on his property yeah, um, yeah, to, yeah, sort yeah. Of, to sort of to sort of um eliminate a little bit of that problem i would venture to guess yeah you i mean you can also amplify the the microbe count by by pulling soil or compost from your own field and using that to inoculate the brew and then you'd just be introducing more of the same microbes that are in the field some of them die off in the brew though there there are things that, that don't really um survive as well in a in a solution like that that's that's kind of allowed to run rampant one of the best arguments i think i heard for the korean natural farm although i did like your argument as, as just the elemental approach or whatever you called it i think the the best objection i heard was that maybe the manufacturing processes for some of those um amendments is not particularly um uh environmentally friendly yeah, um, there, even there, if there, the end product might be totally there there are situations where if you're trying to do that on a large scale 
And when I say large scale, I'm not even talking about like 10 acres. I'm talking about like thousands of acres. So if you're trying to do an IMO pile, a Korean natural farming like pile of, of uh, people will like inoculate sawdust or they'll inoculate rice bran or they'll inoculate all these. It, it's mainly materials from their own property, which is really cool. They're, they're closing the loop that way. But to do that in in a farming practice with thousands of acres, it, you'd need, you're not going to turn that pile by hand. You're going to turn it with a tractor and you're going to apply it with a tractor. And often like you're going to need to do multiple applications. Like it's not just, you, you can do it once, but you can benefit from multiple applications every year. I would tell people to apply limestone and, and do one tillage event to incorporate the limestone and incorporate the copper and the manganese and the zinc and all, all that stuff that you need. Those minerals will be there for often hundreds of years. And that, that just depends on the rainfall you get. If, if you're in parts of the world with less than 40, per, 40 inches of rainfall, those minerals will probably be in your, in your soil for a thousand years. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like with my field, I did, I did do a tillage event with the intention of not doing it again for a long time. I wanted, I wanted to get all the, the minerals in there the first year, and then I'm just going to mulch on top of it. I'm going to bring in, there's, there's a bunch of uh, tree companies around here, a buddy of mine, his dad has a tree company and I can call him up this summer and have him drop off 20 yards of hardwood chips. And I'm just going to cover, cover the aisles of my garden with that. Let, let me ask you this, man. Um, you got me thinking, you know, to your point, it, it does sound like it would be hard to use some of those, the K and F sort of techniques at a large scale. Um, do you think maybe that's more of an indictment on the scale of our, agricultural system here in America, as opposed to like a knock on Korean natural farming, because um, personally, you know, it seems to me that um, these giant consolidated um, agricultural operate, these giant corn fields out and just everywhere in the Midwest, you know? Um, yeah. It, it seems like maybe we should focus more on small scale um, production that is closer to the end user of the we, product. We would be a lot better off as a country if, most of our food supply was supplied by market farms and it, it would solve food quality issues. It would also solve environmental issues. Um, I think there's kind of a sweet spot in between the two worlds because it's, it's not very practical to expect that change to happen even in five years. Like there are going to be giant farms around for a long time. And a lot of those farmers are, they're at least open to the conversation of not using Roundup, not using too much nitrogen every well, year. It seems like a lot of those farmers sort of got locked into these agreements where they are forced to use Roundup just because yeah. they're being red taped into bankruptcy and they can't compete with, with these larger operations and they're forced to basically like get with it or, or go out of business. Yeah, you're, you're, you're uh, familiar with this. Yeah, so there, there is there is a famous uh, court case with Monsanto and an, an organic corn farmer planted his field and next next door a farmer planted Monsanto's Roundup Ready corn. What that means is they inserted a gene to make it tolerant to Roundup sprays as it as it's growing. So they you know they they that that corn tasseled out pollinated the organic farmer's field. And Monsanto fought them in court and said, hey, your, your corn now has whatever, 20% of our genetics incorporated into it. You owe us money. I remember that. Sued this fucking dude into poverty. And they, they won. And now that is a legal precedent that people have to worry about. And I haven't really paid attention. That, this, was back, this was back when I was working for a lab growing that corn, that corn seed. Uh, we had seed, I was working for a postdoc, uh, a doctoral candidate and, uh, she, she had seed from Monsanto, Pioneer, Syngenta, all these big agribusinesses. And we were, we were looking for effects on microbiology in that, in that transgenic corn. And while I was working there, I had access to 
the research database and I was digging around, I, I became aware of how bad of a business Monsanto was. You know, I was that guy at the at the college party. What was, everyone... it? What was the time frame here? What's that? What was the time frame here when you were doing this? Uh, this was in 2009 or so. I, I had started growing cannabis when I was when I was going to, to school in Portland. Um, but yeah, it was um, it wasn't a job for me. It was more just a hobby in the backyard. I was just curious about how you got um, looped into this Monsanto because like I feel like there's a point in everyone's life where they figure they're like, oh, these guys are fucking evil. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say I was that guy at the college party. Everyone's like drinking and having a good time, and I was like, "Dude, have you heard of Monsanto? Like, they're the most evil corporation you've never heard of." And everyone's just like, "I'm trying to have a good time. Let's not talk about this." I was the other guy at the party. I was like, "Can you shut the fuck up?" And then two yeah. years later, I was like, "Oh shit, man! Yeah. What was that guy talking about? Like, damn, I think he was onto something." Yeah, I mean, well, there's not really much much you can do. There, there, well. There, there are things you can do to fight that. Um, you can, you can, you can convince farmers to not grow the seed. Well, and, it's everywhere now. Even in Vermont, like ninety plus percent of our corn now is being uh, grown GMO corn and whatever about the GMO part of it. But it does seem like it comes with all this extra um, pesticide usage. These Roundup Ready seeds, where you pretty like you're locked into basically using Monsanto products. Yeah, and they're they're those products are they're products that are sold with lies. The this is old Nazi science, isn't it? These like chemical fertilizers. <laughs> Bayer Bayer owns Monsanto, so yeah. They're but what I, where I was going with that is they they seduce the farmers by saying you'll get a better yield, you'll get better weed control, which is kind of true. That there are maybe at the beginning, huh? It seems like it's true maybe at the start. There are tillage strategies that you can use so you don't have to spray anything. It's just they've they've been it, they've been drowned out by the like siren song of Monsanto pretty much. It, they're they're saying, hey, do this and you you'll see better profits. You'll see fields that are cleaner. They 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 convinced farmers that a field with nothing but corn in it is pretty. And it's kind of disgusting. Like it's Yeah, it's, we don't need all that fucking corn. Yeah, and, we don't and also it. it seems like they kind of lure them in with these federal, like these subsidies. Like, hey, man, you're struggling. Like, just grow our corn. We'll get you a new fucking tractor, some yep. new debt to fucking heap on top of your existing oh, yeah, debt. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, like, where I guess where I was going with that is that they, it's a lie, and it's a lie because if you if you over the using Roundup and that farming strategy for corn, soybeans, cotton is it always goes hand in hand with overuse use of nitrogen so these farming practices are literally just destroying midwest soil it's getting flushed down the mississippi and it's stuff that takes thousands of years to rebuild and so and so that's kind of the ultimate irony isn't it they're being told this is going to increase your yield when really it seems like those right. chemicals are burning their fucking soils out Yep. And also polluting their water supply. Yep, and it it, it is it, it is burning the soil. Like the the um, the organic matter in the soil gets oxidized and <clears throat> and burnt out, and that changes the soil structure. It's less less resilient to erosion. Um, so what happens in these situations is, is the farmers have run a conventional system for ten years, twenty years, whatever. They've really messed their soil up. And even if they do get talked into going back to an organic system, they stop spraying all that stuff and they try and go back the next year, but their soil is so shot that it's infertile. And then, then they're like, hey, I, I have to do this because look at what happened when I tried to go organic. So it, it's it's just, it's tough. It's like, it's a complicated thing. It takes- you, you find It's like almost like they have to go back to the well that's already poisoned them. It's yeah, like- yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, but you can, you can mitigate um, the effects of all these nasty, like corporate farming practices by cover cropping, doing lighter tillage, uh, always, always keeping something growing on the soil so that it doesn't erode. And if you, what, are some, what are some good cover crops for Vermont? 
Oh, that I mean, that's something that I'm less versed in because I just I just got here. But there I've seen are people using clovers, maybe yeah, um, so alfalfa. We're in zone. Most of the state is zone five, and there's some zone six in the bottom of the state. I think we're zone six down here, but it's it's cold. I mean, it, like the the guy that was advising me, I was building a fence this year, and he's like, "You have to sink those fence posts down three or four feet, otherwise they're going to get pushed up by frost." So you have to use uh, plants that are um, that are cold hardy. So you can use grains are almost always cold, more cold hardy than than leafy plants. So like, for example, like the alfalfa and stuff, you can't you can't plant when it's when it's super cold out. Okay. Uh, there are some plants in the in the pea family that do better in colder temperatures. Like, I think us Austrian. Austrian winter peas are, are I, I have a 50 pound bag of that that I'm going to throw down this year. Rye, rye is really, really tolerant. Um, yeah, I have seen some people using different kind of grains. Yeah. And then in the summer, you can do whatever you can do things there. There's a, a guy that grazes cattle around me. He, he's grown all, all sorts of grains, but he's also grown this, this uh, plant called Sudan grass. And he says he gets like six or seven cuts off a of field with that. It's a little lower nutrition for the cattle, but it's you can you can cut a lot of biomass from a field with it. It grows really fast. Um, there's a lot of options, and this is another thing: cover cropping. Get online, read about it for an hour. You'll be pretty well versed in it at that point, and and have an idea of what direction you want to go. Do these big corn farms are they doing that out in the Midwest? Cover cropping? Yeah. No. Uh, well, I, some of them are, but if you like my, most of my family's from Minnesota and if you drive through Southern Minnesota, you see corn, soybeans, sometimes alfalfa in the winter, there's nothing growing and uh, they don't often plant until like early May. And so the, the soil's barren, but they're, they're allowed to do that or they get away with it because there's so much topsoil. There's glacial tillage. There, there's parts of the country that have uh, dozens of feet of topsoil and then there's other parts of the country that have six inches so if you're in, if you're in a spot like that you have to be really careful do, do you feel any sense of responsibility to sort of uh i don't know be a, a steward of the land i guess in a sense because it seems like some of these other practices are just uh, you know killing the environment and also bringing us a bunch of shitty food absolutely if you if you overuse nitrogen for example which is really soluble it'll once it gets into into the soil and it's it's sitting in the soil solution as nitrate a rain event will wash it out and there, there are a few things like that sulfur nitrogen boron they're very soluble so if you dump like 500 pounds of nitrogen per acre on your field and you get a rain event after that most of that's going to go in the in the in the water the waterways that's that's pretty bad you, you get um i mean that's why that's you get why these algae blooms that's why yeah. lake champlain yeah 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 that's why there's a dead zone in, at the mouth of the mississippi it's it's uh oxygen depletion because of microorganism activity because of all all the fertilizer making it down the river damn so and the same can can happen in small small scale farming um i'm trying i try to be really careful with nitrogen I'll use something like uh, chicken manure or bone meal if I do use it. You guys got chickens? We don't. We don't. The whole hillside has chickens. If if I want chicken eggs, I go to like every neighbor around me, and they've got like an extra dozen. Oh yeah. They're just, they're just giving up. Do they share their poop with you? Give us the uh, chicken shit. Yeah, there's there's a guy. Well, there's a guy also with uh, alpacas too. He said I can come get a wheelbarrow full of that stuff. I probably will take him up. Alpaca on that. shit. Yeah, I don't know the nutritional value of it, but I assume it's pretty good. You can find out, huh? I I will. Yeah, we we have a uh, we have a house rabbit too. We we have a a rabbit that has her own her own bedroom, and uh, I get about <laughs> like two hundred pounds of litter from her every year, and that. That usually goes into like a vegetable, a vegetable row or something like that. And that works good. Oh, ra rabbit manure is exceptional. It's one, it's one of the best. Is there any, is there any animal shit that's not good? I carnivores. I mean, well, so like anything that has the potential to like 
to make you sick if you don't let it sit long enough. Like um, there are people that are that are doing humanure operations, but you need about two years to to process it, and after that, it's as long as you're eating good food, that's <laughs> that's a viable option too. Yeah, I've always wondered about that also because like I see a lot of people like doing home compost and some of the food I see them putting in there is fucking garbage, like leftover processed frozen foods, which I'm sure will break down in time. But I've also wondered, I'm like, OK, is it a, a garbage in garbage out situation here with your compost? It, it can be. And there we have to work this day and age. We have to worry about so many things. There's. There's hormones in, in municipal water systems from birth control. There's PFAS, like polyfloral al alkyl subs. They're like all kinds like, of pharmaceuticals popping up. Yeah, forever chemicals. There's microplastics. There's herbicide contamination. I, I had a load of compost this year that had um, an herbicide that they spray for broadleaf weeds in horse pasture. And I, I tried to grow, well, I, I, I grew a, a giant pumpkin this year but the plant got damaged by this herbicide that was in the compost. So like even, even good composting operations that, that are of the right mindset and they're not trying to, to sell people bad stuff, sometimes get a bad load of horse manure and they, they don't know it. So yeah, yeah, the only way to, to like really ensure that your, your food is clean or your cannabis is clean is to like grow it yourself, you know, like, or, or, you know, like, from gets get it from someone you trust yeah or even still though it sounds like you should really be doing soil samples um, what about water samples have you had uh water samples tested or, or what do you guys have for a water uh, source out there yep ab absolutely so we we we're on a well um uh, and i that was the first one of the first the first thing i did is when i wasn't out in vermont when i, I sent my wife out to buy the house and her like my my non-negotiable coming out here was land and I didn't want to be next to a city. So I sent her out to look at these places. I was still working in Oregon. I said, dig up a soil sample. So she she took a little little shovel out and it was like still cold and like there was some snow on the ground. So she dug up the soil sample. We sent it in the lab. And as soon as I got here, I did a water sample from our well too. And sometimes well water can be really, um, really hard to work with from an irrigation standpoint if there's a lot of sodium in your water you're you're gonna have trouble yeah plants don't really seem to love um a lot of salt it just depends on the salt like sodium is not a plant nutrient so so huh. if, if that's present in like in the like 10 20 30 ppm range if you apply a, enough of that irrigation water you could see damage on plants some plants are more sensitive to it than others cannabis is really Cannabis is really resilient. You can you can hit it with a lot of stuff and it 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 does fine. That's not to say that it doesn't do better with clean water. Sure. It just it just is very tolerant of a lot of things. And I've been itching. You mentioned the PFAS stuff, and I and I've been following some of those reports around the state. And yeah. boy, I I'd like to see some weed samples tested for that. I wouldn't be surprised I, I, to I've find never out. Heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, but like yeah. all the water, all the contaminated well sites I've seen. Um, boy, it really makes me wonder. And I know uh, the cannabis plant is good at just sucking things up. And I wonder if PFAS yeah. is another one of those things that it's good at remediating. I Yeah, I don't know the, the kinetics of it with cannabis. I don't know how it interacts with that in the soil. Um, mm -hmm. Cannabis is a manganese accumulator. So like we we have manganese in our well water, which is good because cannabis wants a lot of it. So we kind of, we, we lucked out in that department. It turns the clothing in your wash like a yellowish color. So that kind of sucks for people who are trying to do their laundry, <laughs> but it's good. It's a good, it's a good plant nutrient. Oh, well, killer. Shit. Yeah. I, I want to see a side-by-side. -side. We'll take some of that St. John's very disgusting metal water and we'll put it in yeah. with like some RO water and some like, yeah, I, I, I would be curious to see something like that. Yeah. I, I don't know how it would interact, but at some point, um, any living thing is going to have a hard time with that. I just don't know the level. Mm. Mm. 
Matt, I'm getting towards the end here. I I, I oh. think I'm running out of shit. Um, I, I want to first um, thank you for your time. Um, this has been fantastic. And Lane as well. She's still listening. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. If, if we missed anything here or shameless plugs or shout outs, or maybe you want to tell us where we could find some of your herb, um, that would be lovely. I'm, I'm out of questions. This has been fantastic. And I hope we could do it again sometime. And I want to wish you the best of luck. Um, but uh, I always leave the last word for my guests. So this is all you right now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We, I mean, we are in, we're a long ways away from most of the shops in the state, but we're in Rattus in Wilmington, uh, Juniper Lane in Bennington, um, Mountain Girl and somewhere on the mountain in Rutland, uh, Pine Grove in Brandon. Uh, let's see, Burn Gallery in in Burlington, Winooski Organics has been a great shop to work with. They're in Winooski, of course, and great guys. Yeah. Cambridge Cannabis and also Capital Cannabis in Montpelier. Well, so you made it up. You made it up pretty far. Yeah, and of course, Bud Barn in Bud Barn's the closest one to us here in uh, in Brattleboro. Scott, yeah. And we're also going to be in Forbin's Finest on Monday. We're doing a drop there. Yeah. Oh, I love those guys. Yeah, they're they're they were. Uh, I think I think they just opened up. They were open like the first of the of the month in February or something like that. When you pull up, you'll never know that there's a dispensary in there. It's yeah, perfect. it's just a straight like a straight wall. You, there's a door there. It's kind of funny. This is the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for having me on, Caleb. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. I want to wish you guys the best of luck here. I've been hearing great things about your herb and. I can't believe you're not video game fans because I was for sure thinking we were going to get a, a Red Dead Redemption story. I, I am. I'm not allowed to play anymore with the kid. So <laughs> and it's that's a good thing for my own health, too. You probably got plenty of other shit to do. Yeah, but I'll make sure to get you uh, a sample, too, next time we see each other. Hey, man, yeah, if you're up in town, please let me know. You got my number, dude. You're You're welcome to stop by. All right. Thanks, man. It's been fun. Yeah, pleasure, man. Take care. Bye.